good afternoon or evening. Everybody doing all right? And first of all, I'm impressed you are here. I know there's a football game going on tonight. Uh, and so thanks for coming out in spite of that. And we'll be here till about 12 o'clock, so no worries about that. <laughs> Uh, hey, let me just say, first of all, for this morning, I was taken to Shady Maple, which was awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible. Uh, I was in a food coma for a little bit afterwards, but I made it through, and uh, it was really good. And then later on for lunch, uh, I went over to, I think, Nooses, and I got a cheesesteak. And so I put on about 10 pounds. Thanks for that. Uh, and I was been really good, but everybody's treated me and just the whole time I've been here. People have been so gracious and so uh, such a blessing to me. So thank you so much. And also so many people have been saying that you'll be praying for my family. And I truly do, do appreciate that. I've got a wife and two beautiful children at home and they are gorgeous and I love them so much. And, and uh, when I'm away, it's always hard in different ways, uh, but I know people are praying for them and, it, you know, it's tough. And so I appreciate your prayers for my wife and for her. as She does a great job being a mother. She's absolutely incredible. But, of course, I covet your prayers for her and our family as I do travel quite a bit. So thank you for those who said you're doing that. And I ask for anybody else to pray if you'd like to as well. We covered a lot of stuff already, as Pastor mentioned. We talked about Sunday morning, about why these issues matter so much. Dealing with biblical authority, equipping people. Uh, to defend their faith, to proclaim the gospel, keeping our kids from walking away. And of course, I mentioned, I got to show you this one more time, the Ark Encounter of the Creation Museum. <clears throat> I know I say this over and over again, I'm really biased. I do understand that. But if I did not work for Answers in Genesis, I would still tell you to go. They are absolutely incredible attractions. Um, God has brought so many talented people to our ministry in different areas to make these things just first class, world class. The attractions, the content, the exhibits, the artistry, it is so well done. You'll be blown away by how good it is and also by the content itself and all the things you can do. I will tell you, you can actually easily spend two days at the Creation Museum, two full days. By the time you listen to speakers and go to the planetarium, a 4D special effects theater, do the walkthrough, botanical garden, zip line courses, petting zoo, other classes. There's so much to do. Then the Ark Encounter, this, the size and scale and the sight and the experience will blow you away. And so it's worth making the trip if you can. Again, those are in Northern Kentucky. That's all part of Answers in Genesis. So if you get a chance, I encourage you to check out the Rainbow Guards. So check out the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. And see the truth of God's word put on vivid display in a very unique and attractive way in our world today. So encourage you one more time to check those particular things out. And again, as we've been saying just throughout the entire conference and all the sessions, really this is all about defending the faith to proclaim the gospel. That's what this is about. It's not about simply winning an argument about the age of the earth, winning an argument about dinosaurs, even winning an argument about any moral issues, but rather defending the authority of the word of God to proclaim the gospel effectively. And that's what this is all about. And that's really what this session is all about as well, ultimately, as we talk about dinosaurs. Now, I got to tell you up front, I love dinosaurs. Even as a grown man, I still love dinosaurs. I uh, love them so much. My wife and I, a few years ago, in Tennessee, made the first ever snow wrecks. Okay. Now, it looks like a white Barney, but we did the best we could <laughs> with what we had. All right. We're teaching our son Ian to love dinosaurs, and he does indeed love dinosaurs. And we're teaching our daughter Macy to love dinosaurs. We love dinosaurs, and as a ministry, uh, these creatures are just awesome. And we have many great sculptures of these dinosaurs made done by Buddy Davis. We've got an animatronic raptor to do our walk through biblical history. We got one of the best Allosaurus fossils. Get this in the entire world that God has blessed us with at the ministry. Cool story about how that came about for a different time, but. We love dinosaurs and lots of people do. And because of that, and the nature of our ministry, one question we get all the time is, well, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And our answer is, you don't. People say, but wait, thought you believed in them. Absolutely we do. But here's the thing. We don't try to squeeze things into God's word. What we do is we start with the Bible and use this to explain the world around us, including dinosaurs. That's what we've done during all the other sessions. That's what we'll do during this session as well. We're going to stand on the authority of God's word and use biblical history to understand these amazing creatures. We're going to use a biblical worldview to give us the right understanding about dinosaurs. Because remember, what the Bible does do for us, it gives us the big picture of history. It gives us the right understanding of the past that we apply to the evidence in the present. And then we can explain dinosaurs. 
and use real operational science to confirm that the biblical glasses are indeed the right ones to put on. Because as we've said at numerous times in numerous ways by now, ultimately, this issue is a worldview issue. Because again, all scientists had the same stuff in the present, the same dinosaur bones in the present. But they interpret those things differently in the present. And they made different guesses about where those things came from and thus their origin and age based on their different starting assumptions about the unseen past, based on their different worldviews. And again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And you might be saying, Brian, you've said that 10 times now. Yes, that's on purpose because it's such an important point. And repetition is the mother of memory. With that in mind, I'll give you one more story. A story about a guy who thought he was dead. He thought he was dead. And he's pretty upset about that. Can't blame him, right? So he went to a doctor. He said, hey, doc, I've got a problem. I'm dead. Doctor said, well, you walked into my office and you're talking to me, so surely you're alive, right? And the guy said, well, you know, when things die, they tend to twitch for a while. Maybe that explains my ability to continue to walk and talk at this point. Doctor said, okay, but hey, I've got your medical chart right here. It says you're perfectly healthy. And the guy said, yeah, well, who knows if you're reading that correctly. And maybe even somebody came in and swapped out the charts when you weren't looking. Doctor said, okay, he got a little frustrated, he thought for a minute. He got an idea. He asked the guy, do dead men bleed? The guy thought for a a second. Heart stops pumping, blood does not circulate. No, dead men do not bleed. Doctor said, very good. You got a needle? Give me your finger. He pricked the guy on the finger and blood came out. And the guy looked at his finger and said, wow, how about that? Dead men do bleed. (laughs) Now, did the doctor have evidence? He did. It was actually very good evidence. Did the man find it convincing? No. Why? Because in each case, his worldview tried to interpret what he was looking at to make it fit his preconceived ideas. Again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. We saw a good example of this last night talking about the age of the earth. Again, remember, up until about the late 1700s, early 1800s, most scientists believed the Bible and thought the earth was only thousands of years old. Do you remember what they found in the early 1800s to change their mind, reject the Bible, and instead believe in millions of years? Remember what they found? Oh, very good. They found nothing, right? Nothing tangible. But what they did find, if you remember, was a new worldview. Guys like James Hutton and Charles Lyell, they basically argued in basically the early 1800s that you could explain all the rock layers and all the fossils with only natural processes. If you just give those natural processes enough what? Time. And thus was born the idea of millions of years. Again, not based on any new evidence. Same rock layers and same fossils, but a different interpretation based on the assumption that God's word is wrong about the past and that man's guess is a better starting point. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And what we've seen basically from that point in time has been a shift in much of these scientific scientific community away from God's word as their foundation to much of the thinking about the past so now man's word has become the ultimate authority and what was the motivation in this shift of foundation remember Charles Lell said it like this his goal was to free science from Moses get God out of science because again not a head issue it's a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue And from that point in time, the majority of the scientific community adopted this naturalistic, essentially atheistic worldview. And they interpret all things through that grid. So in a real sense, from that point in time, they got brainwashed for that particular philosophy. And then they interpret all present-day observations through that philosophy. In a real sense, they've been brainwashed. And it's a lot easier than you think to get brainwashed. I think we're friends by now, right? Do you guys mind if I try to brainwash you really quickly? Would that be okay? One person, you nodded yes. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) I'm going to try to brainwash you. And I'll do it with a simple story. At the end of the story will be two questions. Now, if you know these specific answers to those two questions, congrats, you've not been brainwashed. But if you don't know, I brainwashed you. I got you to think the way I want you to think. You most likely have no idea how it happens, and I'll bet it happens in the very first sentence. Now, if you know the answers, don't say anything. Just raise your hands when I ask. Here's a story. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. And he jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left, and he jogged back home. 
As he was jogging back home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. That's the story. Here are the two questions. Who were the masked men and why did he leave home jogging? If you know the answers, just raise your hand. Right, you guys are better than average. All right. So around, around 91% of you have been brainwashed. Don't worry. I've been there before. All right. I'll give you another shot. Here's the story again. A little bit quicker. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. And he jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint. Left is important. He jogged and turned left. He jogged and turned left. And he jogged back home. As he was jogging back home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Again, who were the masked men? Why did he leave home jogging? Anybody new get it? Anybody new? All right, so we're still batting around 91% of you are still brainwashed. Congratulations. All right. But again, I've been there. I really have. So don't worry. I'm going to unbrainwash you. And I'll do it with a simple picture. And when you see this, you'll probably kick yourself or maybe your neighbor and think, why could I not figure this out? That was so simple. You ready? Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. <laughs> he jogged and turned left and turned left and turned left. And he jogged back home. And the two masked men were the <laughs> catcher and the umpire. That is so simple, right? Why couldn't you figure that out? Well, because probably when I said he left home, what did you think of? A house. Jogging for exercise. He came back to masked men. Had to be bad guys. And notice, once you started interpreting those words in that particular way, it was almost impossible to see them in any other way. In a real sense, you were brainwashed. Can I show you how multiple generations and millions of kids today or in a similar way, being brainwashed. Give them a book like this that says, I can read about dinosaurs. And what do you think are the first words in the book? Ah, you guys had this book too. All right, very good. <laughs> yeah, another book, first words millions of years ago. Even good old Dr. Seuss, not the first words, but millions of years ago. And also think about it like this. Meet little Joey. He's five and he's about to start school public, private, homeschool, Christian school, it doesn't matter. And he already knows about things like evolution, ape men, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, et cetera, et cetera. But how before school? Meet Joey's preschool teachers. Oh, but they're so cute and harmless, right? But guys, I think in many cases we have failed to recognize a very important truth, and that is this, we as Christians, are not the only fishers of men. We are not. And dinosaurs had been one of the main baits that the secularists used, driven by the enemy, to reel people, especially kids, into a secular evolutionary worldview that basically says this. The Bible's history is not true and cannot be trusted. But again, if you cannot believe the Bible's history, why on earth trust what it says about salvation? And so that's why it's so important that we are ready to give an answer for our faith, even about things like dinosaurs. So let's put on those biblical glasses and see what the Bible can tell us or imply to us about these amazing creatures. So on which day of creation were they made? One, two, three, four, five, or six? The answer is day six. And how do we know that? Well, because we drew two T-Rexes in that picture and that proves it. Actually, why did we do that? Does the Bible explicitly say when God made the T-Rex? Of course, the answer is no. But uh, it does. Get, we can't figure this out with some basic logic. For example, we agree that T-Rex is a land animal. By the way, dinosaurs by definition are land animals with a certain hip structure, legs underneath the body. Technically, things that uh, the reptiles that swam in the water like the plesiosaurs or the ones that flew the pterosaurs, they are not technically dinosaurs. All are usually associated with them. But dinosaurs, by definition, are land animals. Land animals were created on day six according to, to God's word. Therefore, T-Rex was created on day six. Well, that makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward. And again, it's important to remember the Bible is not a science textbook. It doesn't give us all the details. The Bible does not list every name of every animal ever created. And I am glad for that. Could you imagine trying to read through that list as you read through your Bible? Who's read Leviticus or Numbers? All right. And plus, we do have proof positive that Adam lived with the dinosaurs because here is a picture that Eve took. 
right? And someone would say, okay, but wait, if God made dinosaurs on day six, then why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And it's true, we do not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. For the same reason, we don't find words like computer, locomotive, Facebook, or Twitter in the Bible. All right, the word dinosaur is a fairly new word, not invented until 1841 by a guy named Sir Richard Owen. It means terrible lizard. It wasn't used much until the early 1900s. So, of course, we do not expect to find the word dinosaur, especially in older English translations. The word itself was not even invented yet. But there's another word in older English translations before evolution became popular that seems to, in many cases, describe various known types of dinosaurs. And that word is dragon, translated from the Hebrew word tanim, repeated numerous times throughout the Old Testament. Now, the word tanim, just translated dragon, it's more flexible than dinosaur, but it includes the dinosaur kind under its umbrella. One example, that could be Psalm 74, 13. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters, which may refer to something like the Kronosaurus or the Plesiosaur, something like that. But there's also a couple places in the Bible where it appears that God describes a dinosaur. Like over in the book of Job, God tells Job, to behold behemoth. He wants Job to look at it, so it's a real creature. And if you remember the context here, God's putting Job in his place, right? Job, I know you don't understand what's happening right now, but see my creative power, know that I'm God, and trust me, I've got this, even if you don't understand. And so he's showing him his creative power. And if you got a study Bible with footnotes, it may suggest to you that behemoth was possibly a hippo or an elephant. But let's see if the biblical description fits a hippo or an elephant. Verse 16 says his strength is in his loins, the power is in the muscles of his belly. Basically translated, he's got a big belly. And of course, we agree elephants fit that part of the description, no argument there. So do hippos and so does that guy. They all fit that part of the description. But verse 17 becomes very distinctive about behemoth. It says that his tail sways like a cedar, like the cedars of Lebanon, like a big tree swaying in the wind. That is what the tail of behemoth looked like, a tree that swayed in the wind and hit a microphone. (laughs) Have you ever seen the tail of a hippo or an elephant? What terrible examples of trees, right? Maybe a twig, maybe a leaf or a flap, but not a tree. So take a tree-like tail, put it on a hippo, it doesn't fit. You put it on an elephant, scares the poor guy half to death, all right? You put it on a sauropod dinosaur, Diplodocus, Seismosaurus, Titanosaurus, Argentinosaurus, whichever one you want, fits the description really, really well. And that leads to a nice little side note, and that is this. If your Bible has footnotes, those things can be handy, but let's remember, those footnotes, those study notes are not the inspired word of God. The text itself is the inspired word of God. And the best commentary on the Bible is always the Bible. It is the ultimate authority. Verse 18 says this about behemoth. His, two, his bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. Here's the front leg of a brachiosaurus. Those would be like bars of iron. And there's me leaning against a replica of a brachiosaurus at the Chicago Field Museum. Those would be like bars of iron. Verse 19, behemoth is first among the ways of God. This is the biggest, most preeminent example of God's creative power for Job to see on land. And from all that being said, it appears that God is describing something like this to Job. Job, behold, behemoth, who I made along with you on day six, feeds on grass like an ox, whose tail sways like a tree in the wind. Now, of course, I got that clip from what movie? Yeah, Jurassic Park. Who's seen Jurassic Park? Bunch of heathens. All right, very good. (laughs) Who's watched all of them for research purposes only like myself? (laughs) Watch out for those movies. Of course, there's a lot of violence and bloodshed and evolutionary dogma. Also, watch out. They're trying to convince you of something, kind of subtly, but it's through all of the movies. They're trying to convince you that some dinosaurs evolved into what? Birds. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's a subtle theme through all of them. Look really closely because that's a popular notion in our secular scientific age. But moving on, there's another creature called Leviathan in the book of Job. Again, God wants Job to look at it, so it's a real creature. It may be a chronosaurus. We don't know for sure. But it gives a long description about Leviathan. And it's aggressive. He's a powerful creature. Don't mess with him. And then it says that... uh, 
Well, this is pretty crazy. His sneezing throws out flashes of light, and his breath there at the bottom sets coals ablaze, and flames dart from his mouth. So now it's not just a dragon, but it's a fire-breathing dragon. And, of course, the kids are like, cool, right? But everybody's like, but wait a minute. Are you saying you guys at Answers in Genesis believe in the possibility of a fire-breathing critter? But before you discount the possibility altogether, take a look at what God did with the tiny bombardier beetle. Known to scientists, it's the bombardier beetle. When threatened, it fires out a burning liquid at a temperature of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, almost boiling point. It does it by pumping a liquid fuel into a reaction chamber where a catalyst ignites the mixture. The burning chemicals have nowhere to go but out and with a bang. So that little guy basically shoots out liquid fire out his backside. I was at a church a couple years ago, someone yelled from the congregation, I know someone who does that, which, which is disturbing. I mean, not what we're talking about. It's a defense mechanism. He can shoot it up to 70 times in a row like a machine gun. Kills other insects, it's, it kills small mammals, and it's harmful to human skin. Now, if God can do that with a less than one inch beetle, what can he do with a multi-ton beast like Leviathan, right? I think about some of the things God has made. You have octopuses today that can change their shape to mimic things in the water. They can change their color through various means. Or things like even lightning bugs. So simple yet so amazingly complex. Did you realize that the chemical reaction that takes place inside of them to produce that light is 100% efficient? No energy is lost in the conversion which is astounding because most of our lights lose about 90% of their energy in the form of heat. But God's design is better than ours. Imagine that. Or things like the electric eel. By the way, it's kind of cool. On the news recently, over in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I taught for around 13 years at their aquarium, they had uh, things set up where they, they piped in wires to the electric eel's tank, and they piped the wires to the lights for the Christmas tree, and as it gave off flashes, it lit the Christmas tree. <laughs> really, really kind of cool, all right? So you have electric eel. This thing makes electricity. And think about it. If you just found the bones of an electric eel, would you know it produced electricity? Probably not. And besides all that, most animals produce methane, and that's a flammable gas. And really, all you need is a way to ignite it, and you've got a flamethrower. So lots of ways to explain this possibility with Leviathan. And then there's other creatures in the Bible, like the flying fiery serpents. Maybe that refers to pterosaurs or rampharynchus or something like that. And we could go on. And someone would say, okay, that makes sense. But then wait, if dinosaurs lived with man, then what did they eat? That's a good and fair question. And technically, we've kind of answered this already. Now, let's answer the question this way, though. What did the T-Rex, with those big old teeth, eat originally? What did the original T-Rex eat? A, B, C, or D? What's the answer? Uh, very good. Yeah, the answer is A. In case you're wondering, well, how do you guys know that? Well, it's that great Sunday school answer. The Bible tells us so. Again, in the original perfect creation, God told Adam and Eve they were to eat fruit. And then the animals, they were to eat plants. Originally, everything was vegetarian. And I know that sounds weird to us today because we enjoy eating Philly cheesesteaks. All right? A lot. They're really good. I get that. All right? But really, again, it makes really good biblical sense because... There was no death in this world until after Adam sinned. And that means you cannot eat meat until after he sinned. Because when we eat meat, we're eating an animal that has died. Before sin, no death. Everything has to be vegetarian. That means originally before the fall, things like the T-Rex and other dinosaurs and other creatures ate things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples and coconuts. And some will say, wait, are you saying the T-Rex with those six-inch serrated fangs Hey, things like fruits, vegetables, pineapples, and coconuts? Well, absolutely. Have you ever tried to bite into a coconut? That'd be a bad idea, right? That's like a redneck's famous last words. Hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> I'm from North Carolina. It's okay, all right? <laughs> no, we get a knife to cut into a coconut. T-Rex T -Rex was just pre-equipped. And besides that, if you find the fossil of a creature... And it's got big, long, sharp teeth. What is the only thing you know for sure about that creature? It's got big, long, sharp teeth, right? There are lots of creatures today in our fallen, broken, messed up world that have big, long, sharp teeth that primarily are only vegetarian. A few examples. Look at this primate from South America. Look at those teeth. 
You know, he's picked on in high school. <laughs> and that guy's vegetarian. <laughs> or look at this skull. Look at those vicious teeth. That must belong to a meat eater. Well, that skull belongs to a fruit bat. And I bet you know what those eat. Yeah, nobody wants to say it, but yes, they eat fruit. Or look at that skull. Look at those vicious teeth. That must belong to a terrible meat eater. That skull belongs to a vicious bamboo killer. <laughs> or look at this one with those saber-tooth-like teeth. That belongs to a creature still around today. It's called the Chinese water deer, also called the vampire deer for obvious reasons. It's a real creature. It's really freaky, and it's really vegetarian. But the point is this. Especially in the perfect world before man sinned, you could hang out with the lions and the tigers and the bears. Thank you. All right. <laughs> oh, my. Or you could bring a T-Rex home as a pet. Just be sure you got enough room in the house. It was a different world back then. But that's the way it was, and that's not the way it is. What happened that changed everything? A three-letter word called sin changed everything. Exactly right. The second C of the seven C's, the corruption. When Adam sinned, that brought death and suffering into this world. It changed everything. And by the way, this real biblical history, it answers one of the most fundamental questions all of humanity has. The question we hear all the time in different ways. Why would an all-knowing, all-powerful God make a world like the one we live in today with so much death and suffering and cancer and disease? Why do you make it like this? And the short answer is he didn't. You see, God gave us what he wanted for us. He created it perfect. Who wrecked this world? We did in our sin through Adam. We wrecked God's perfect creation. We brought death and the curse into this world through our sin. And by the way, God shows his love, mercy, grace, sovereignty, and power by providing a bridge of salvation for us through Christ even after we wrecked his perfect creation. That's the biblical perspective on that issue. But... Bible was clear, it was man's sin that brought death and suffering and bloodshed and cancer and stuff like that into this world. And that's why there's carnivorous activity and that's why there are calamities and that's why there's cancer. And the Bible knows this and the older I get, the more I recognize this. All of creation groans. The older my body gets, the more my body groans. All right, you guys, some of you understand that. Some don't, you'll get it someday. All right, it's a broken creation. It's groaning in pain because of man's sin. And by the way, again, this is why you can't squeeze millions of years into the Bible, as we talked about in detail last night. Because if you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, you'll put death before sin. And a quick summary. If there's death before sin, that will mean man's sin had no effect on creation. Death was already around. And if death is not the consequence or the payment for sin, like the Bible does teach, then Jesus' death cannot and does not pay our sin debt. And we just undermine the foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether we meant to or not. And again, guys, that's why it matters so much. And it's not until after the fall of man that the diet for dinosaurs would have changed, like it did for many other creatures. Not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as he gave you plants to eat, now Noah, you can eat everything. And this is why it is okay to eat filet mignon wrapped in bacon or Philly cheesesteaks today. All right, you can do that now. It's all right. It's also not until after the flood that God told Noah, I'm going to put the fear and dread of man into all the beasts of the earth. So before the flood, animals weren't scared of man. Probably a good relationship. After a flood, animals are scared of man. And typically if they're scared of you, either they run away from you or they attack you. Keep that in mind for later on. And someone would say, okay, well, then uh, that makes sense. But then were dinosaurs on the ark? And the short answer is, yes, they were. The Bible says this, that God brought to Noah pairs of all the land-dwelling, air-breathing animals. That would include dinosaurs. And someone say, wait, I mean, the ark was big. Got details on that last night. But was it big enough? I mean, aren't there hundreds or thousands of variations of dinosaurs? Well, just like there are lots of variations of the dog kind, but just the one kind. And lots of variations of the horse kind, but just the one kind. Same thing with the dinosaurs. There are lots of variations of the ceratopsia kind, but just the one kind. There are lots of variations of the sauropod kind, but just the basic kind. There are around 60 to at most 80 some dinosaur kinds, multiplied by two, not that many needed on the ark. And some will say, okay, not that many, that's fine, but are you serious right now? And at least a very common misconception. You realize that the average size of a dinosaur was equal to that of a bison. 
like a really big cow. And some were actually as small as chickens. It's true. If those were still around today, we could eat some good old KFD. <laughs> and of course, it will taste like what? Chicken. It'd have to. Exactly right. But as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started small. You see, how do you know all of them? Well, because they hatched from eggs. And the biggest neck can get is about the size of a football. Because the bigger the egg gets, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But the shell can't get too thick because then oxygen can't get through to keep the creature alive. So max size for an egg is about that big. So that means all your dinosaurs, whether you're talking about the T-Rex, the Segosaurus, the Diplodocus, the Seismosaurus, whatever, all started off about the size of a football. And guys, we still see the same sort of thing today. When alligators or crocodiles hatch from eggs, you can hold them in the palm of your hand. Give them a few years. They could hold you in their belly if you're not careful. Right? And plus, remember, God brought the animals to Noah. So I'm pretty sure God's got it figured out. You don't have to bring the biggest ones. And we're going to bet that God brought young adults to Noah of the bigger animals for many uh, practical reasons. You bring young adults because they are smaller. It just makes really good common sense. Young adults of the giraffes, the elephants, the bison, the dinosaur, etc. Just be sure there is a pink one and a blue one. That's important later. And I'm sure God's got that figured out too, right? You bring youngins because they weigh less and they eat less and they sleep more and they're tougher in particular ways. And then think about it. Young adults, they will live longer after the flood to reproduce more offspring to fill the earth. And that's the whole reason you're taking them to begin with. So lots of reasons to take those young adults. So that's why when you go to the Ark Encounter, you'll see tons of displays showing dinosaurs in the Ark. Juvenile T-Rexes, about the size of a big dog, a Great Dane. And these, uh, again, juvenile dinosaurs, sauropods, all sorts of variations in the different cages as you go through the Ark Encounter because they were on the Ark. And actually, their numbers are included. The number I showed you last night, they're in that number. They were on the Ark. And then on that day, once they were on there, of course, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and cracked the crust of the earth and reshaped the whole surface of this globe. That flood destroyed this world. And because of that event, we expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And as we saw last night, we do, and their features scream a rapid recent global deposition as God's word records. And some would say, okay. But if that's all true, and it is, then, you know, they were made around 6,000 years ago. Many died around 4,300 years ago during the global flood. And then shouldn't we find some forensic, you know, tangible, touchable evidence these things lived not that long ago? We should and we do. We find it all the time now. But secular scientists don't know what to do with it. It doesn't fit their worldview, so they struggle with it. But we're finding it all over the place. Just a few quick examples. We are now finding again and again and again and again, we're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in their bones. You say, what do you mean by soft? I mean, it's literally still soft. It's still pliable. It's still stretchy. And quite often, there are blood vessels and red blood cells still intact in this tissue. Like in this Triceratops remnant or this duckbill dinosaur remnant or this T-Rex remnant. And I could just show you so many other examples. It just would take too much time. It gets boring after a while. But the same old thing, soft tissue and dinosaur bones. And we're finding this tissue all over the world, on pretty much every continent. And then we're finding it in all the rock layers. And some of the specimens, the bones thought to be like 500 million years old. They're still pliable tissue. It's just not that old. And guys, that soft tissue... That organic material is made of mostly water like our flesh. And it should not last hundreds of years after the creature's death. Maybe thousands of years in special conditions like post-flood, but no way millions. It is phenomenal confirmation of the biblical time scale. And some will look at that, rightfully so, and say, you know, well, that's got to be a slam dunk, right? That's got to convince the evolutionists that they're wrong about their time frame and rethink their time frame for maybe dinosaurs and evolution, right? But it won't necessarily. Because ultimately, remember, it's not a head issue, it's a heart issue that becomes a worldview issue. And your worldview, it tells you how to interpret what you're looking at to make it fit your preconceived ideas. Let me give you a great example of this. I'm going to show you a clip of a brilliant, nice lady named Dr. Mary Schweitzer. She's the one who found this particular sample. But She's approaching it from an evolutionary perspective. And as she does, I want you to hear her conclusion. And as you do, bear in mind, brilliant woman, the wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions, a good example, again, of the power of a worldview. 
not going to believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproinged and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it, that's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump inducing scientific moments, that's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Did you catch that? Rethink what? Don't rethink the age. There must be some chemical process that we have never, ever observed that is somehow making these things last for millions of years. She's committed to the evolutionary perspective, thus she won't see it any other way. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Why do we find all this soft tissue? Well, the right answer is simply this. Most of them died not that long ago during a global flood, right? Around 4,300 years ago. Now, of course, some dinosaurs were on the ark, and they got off the ark, and they lived with man post-flood. And so we should find historical documentation of man with dinosaurs if that is the case. We should and we do. But remember, the word dinosaur is a new word. Before 1841, these creatures were called something else. They were called, for the most part, dragons. And we find these legends literally everywhere in pretty much every single culture all around the world. Now, sure, some of those legends have been embellished over time, no doubt, but many of them accurately describe various known types of dinosaurs. And even the honest evolutionist knows this. Watch this little clip from the Discovery Channel talking about this. There is one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that's ever existed. A creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, even the Inuit, who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found. Even they have stories of this animal, the dragon. Cultures from different continents, people who had no contact with one another, yet all of them have stories describing the same mythical animal. Could it be these stories were more than myth? What if we discovered that this creature that haunts our imagination had once been real? Now, of course, I'll try to explain away those legends with an evolutionary perspective, but the point is they acknowledge them, and they are everywhere. A few quick examples of these legends. St. George is said to have killed a dragon around 275 A.D., and the description of the dragon that he killed fits of a dinosaur known as Baryonyx. In that very same region, we find bones of Baryonyx. There's a city in France renamed after the dragon that was killed there, described as bigger than an ox with long, sharp-pointed horns on its head. Probably a triceratops of some variation. Marco Polo, the man, not the game, reported in 1271 AD that the emperor in China, he used dragons to pull his chariots in his parades. Which, by the way, if I were an emperor and there were dragons around, they would pull my chariots too because that is awesome. <laughs> it's really good sense. Well-known historians like Aristotle and Herodotus, they reported seeing flying dragons. Herodotus, for example, went to go see the winged serpents as they flew for Egypt, as they were known to do. He described them when he saw them as like water snakes. They were reptilian, and their wings were membranous, like the wings of a bat. They were not feathered. The Astoria Animalia said dragons were still around in the 1500s, but were rare by then and fairly small in comparison to older dragons. Also, all over the world, we find drawings and carvings that appear to show man with dinosaurs. A few examples of this. Here's a piece of ancient Egyptian pottery. Seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. Here's a Roman mosaic from the 2nd century A.D. Again, two possibly long-necked dinosaurs. Or go to northern England, visit Carlisle Cathedral. Visit the tomb of Bishop Bell, who died around 1500. And there are brass strips around his tomb. Look at those brass strips. They're carvings of animals. 
Some of those carvings look possibly like known types of dinosaurs. Or go to this temple built in Cambodia about a thousand years ago. Zoom in on the column of this temple. You have what appears to be a clear depiction of a stegosaurus, the dinosaur with the plates on the back. And then bringing it back over to the States, over in Colorado, here's a pictogriff of what might be a triceratops, big body, plated back of the head, three horns. Now the evol evolutionists say, no way, that's just a goat. Those Indians were terrible artists. <laughs> if you look above, they do know what a goat looks like, right? But it gets a lot better than that down the road from there over in Utah. Another pictogriff of what is clearly depicting a sauropod dinosaur. Long tail, four legs, long neck, and the head. And this one's been authenticated so many times, it's ridiculous now. We find different, here's a, what appears to be a pterosaur, some variation in this pictograph. Here's another sauropod dinosaur in a different cave wall painting. Here's one from Aboriginal people of a creature they, ca they call Yaru. And they say Yaru was real. And they're showing us in this picture the time that Yaru ate one of their friends. And they're giving us an x-ray view into Yaru's stomach. And there's their friend. And they're trying to get their friend back or get revenge or whatever. Uh, kind of sad and funny at the same time. But uh, they said Yaru was real. And Yaru looks a whole lot like we call a plesiosaur. And I could just literally go on and on and on. These legends are everywhere. And the honest evolutionists evolutionist should try to deal with these legends and explain them from their worldview. And some have tried and when they do, it gets really, really interesting. Their worldview really shines through. If you want to example of this, watch this particular scientist try to explain these legends from an evolutionary perspective. Finding the whole picture involves solving the biggest dragon riddle of all. How does the dragon keep turning up in so many cultures? Dr. Jones believes that the dragon is actually hardwired into our brains remnants of instincts that kept our evolutionary ancestors from being eaten. And the fact that they were dealing at that time and for millions of years after that time with three basic predators, and these were big cats that would hunt them, and these were uh, big birds with 10-foot wingspans would hunt them, uh, or big snakes would hunt them. Over the millennia, the image of the three basic predators of our ancient ancestors merged into one terrible creature, the dragon. Still not sure what to do with that, all right? And by the way, that guy's brilliant. He's not dumb. He's a smart man, especially in his field. But again, wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. Ultimately, it's a worldview issue. What, it, what his problem is, he's got the wrong starting assumption about the past. He's trusting man's ideas over God's clear, revealed word about history. Wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And that leads to the very last popular question about dinosaurs that people tend to ask, understandably so. What happened to them? I'm going to tell you, but this is where the talk gets pretty deep. <laughs> now, why did they die? We'll make some good biblical educated guesses here in a moment. But before we do, guys, the evolutionists have a lot of guesses as to what may have happened to the dinosaurs. Of course, some suggest today, many suggest today, that some dinosaurs evolved into birds. Very popular notion presented on numerous things like Jurassic Park, so forth and so on. But as we saw earlier on Sunday morning, this is biologically and genetically impossible. Because natural selection and mutations tend to shuffle existing genetic information or lose it over time, not add it. You have to add new information to change a dinosaur into a bird. This is genetically, biologically impossible. And then, of course, very popular today is the notion that maybe a meteorite or asteroid hit the earth and killed all the dinosaurs, big and small, but somehow left everything else alive. Should be a cool trick. Some think dinosaurs died of indigestion. Of course, that can be painful, all right? <laughs> Uh, some have suggested, this is a real theory, you can read the first line for yourself, that uh, dinosaurs may have gassed themselves into extinction. And it means what you think it means. Right? <laughs> they started eating the wrong sort of stuff, they got upset stomachs, released too much gas, too much methane into the atmosphere, caused a greenhouse effect, increased the temperature of the earth, and the dinosaurs could not stand the heat. So many bad jokes go right there, right? I really do. I'll limit it to this. That would be the worst kind of climate change. And I'll just stop with that, all right? 
Some think dinosaurs may have overate, some think they might have starved to death, some think a natural catastrophe may have killed off the dinosaurs. I've got my own personal theory. It's also my own personal sense of humor, but I do believe it has a lot of explanatory power. Maybe this is what happened to them. (laughs) Chuck Norris has been around for millions of years, right? Just having fun. So uh, what really happened to them? We can make some biblical educated guesses on this. I'm going to bet, we're going to bet that dinosaurs face many problems post-foot, but at least two big problems. First one's going to be this, climate change. Now, don't get scared. We are not talking about the idea of man caused climate change like it's popular today. We're talking about the idea of God caused climate change. You see, remember from last night, God told Noah the purpose of the flood was to destroy mankind and to wreck this world, to destroy this world that we live, we live in a junkyard compared to what it used to be pre-flood. And as we saw last night before the flood, people lived to be over 900 years of age on average, which is an amazing thought. But then after the flood, that red line's your flood on, after that, they're living just for 400 years, then just for 200 years, then just 100 years of age like we see today, not living near as long. Why? Well, again, genetic bottleneck probably plays a big role in this. Also, it's safe to assume that God accomplished his purpose of wrecking this world. It's a broken creation, so you don't live near as long as you used to live. People nor animals probably affects everything, but especially dinosaurs being bigger animals as a whole. It'll affect them in numerous ways. Also, after the flood is the perfect time for an ice age, as we saw last night. Most likely that's bad for dinosaurs in multiple ways. And there may be a lack of form of food, lots of problems related to climate post-flood that would be a big problem for dinosaurs most likely. So that'd be a big problem number one. Big problem number two will be most likely this, especially post-flood, people most likely hunting them. You say, wait, people hunt dinosaurs? That's right. Remember from earlier, take this thought back off the shelf. I put in the fear and dread of man into all the beasts of the earth. So now, after the flood, either animals tend to run away from you or they attack you. And, of course, the bigger ones with sharp teeth, that could be a problem, right? So kind of putting all this together, after the flood, animals begin to spread out and migrate all over the world. About 100 years later, Tower of Babel, different languages, split up the groups. People begin to move to new regions around the world. And let's say you and your group with your new language, you moved over here. And you ran into a wild herd of chihuahuas. <laughs> you might love that or hate that. I mean, not dangerous, right? But what if you move to a different region? In this region over here, you run into lions or tigers or bears. Thank you. Well, I like that. All right, there we go. Or maybe a T-Rex or an Allosaurus or a couple of raptors. Now, would that be a problem? Of course. So, fellas, in that case, what are we going to do? I heard somebody at a church recently about two months ago. He yelled, run. No. All right. <laughs> maybe if you need to. But we're going to kill the threat, Right. We're going to protect our family, our wives, our kids, our communities. We will kill the threat, just like we do today. Actually, most likely, men hunt dinosaurs for a lot of reasons post-flood. For meat. For the bigger ones, that's a lot of food. Because they're a menace. Of course, the big Tyrannosaurus rex and dinosaurs like that, they got to go. But even your smaller theropods, like your raptors, four or five feet tall, they still bite off your arm or eat your kids or your livestock. That's a problem. Your livestock is your food and your money. Or even the herbivores, the big old Triceratops or Stegosaurus. If one's hanging around, what if that thing's eating your crops and a lot of them? That's your food. That's your money. They're a menace. They got to go. Or maybe you just want to show you're superior, just competition for land. And let's add one more reason to that list. Fellas, let's be honest. If there was a T-Rex around today, what good man does not want a T-Rex head hanging on their wall? Right? <laughs> That's just ultimate man cave stuff. (laughs) Lots of reasons man would most likely hunt dinosaurs, probably to the point of extinction like we do so many times with different critters throughout the ages. You see, dinosaurs are not a mystery if we start from a biblical perspective. They are fascinating creatures, and I love them, but they're not a mystery. When we stand on God's word, we've got answers even about dinosaurs. And then we like to call dinosaurs, we consider them missionary lizards. You say why? Well, two big reasons. First of all, when we properly understand dinosaurs, it reinforces a fundamental truth, which is this. You can trust this book. 
the Bible. It gets everything right. It's right about history. It's right about dinosaurs. It's right about morality. It's right about salvation. Put your faith in Christ. We do that. And then secondly, as we talk about dinosaurs, of course, we can't help but think of death. Why? Well, because they're dead. And why are they dead? According to God's word, the three-letter word is sin. Right? The leading cause of death in this world is birth, and we all die because of sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and all fall short. That's why we all need a Savior. And boy, doesn't our culture love to hear that today? It's interesting. Ask the average person on the street, the student in the classroom, college campus, whatever, ask them, if there's a heaven, do you think you're good enough to go? What will most people say? I got to be I'm good enough, right? I'm not as bad as that person over there. I'm not as bad as Hitler. Don't know why Hitler's the standard, all right? <laughs> but surely I'll get to heaven if there is one. But you see, that fails to recognize what the Bible clearly teaches. You see, according to God's word, if you want to go to heaven, here's the deal. You've got to be perfect because God is perfect. And he, he won't be around any sin without his wrath being poured out on that sin. You want to go to heaven, you better be perfect. That means break one of his laws one time you are done and justly bound for hell. That means tell one lie, you're done and bound for hell. Blaspheme his name one time, you're done and bound for hell. Steal one thing, you're bound for hell. But the news gets worse before it gets better. The Bible says this. Jesus emphasized this, that God sees our motives and our thoughts, and those must be perfect as well. That's a scary thought. That means every motive of your entire life must be God honored first, people second, yourself always last. And then every thought must be pure, not lustful, not coveting, not jealous, not hateful, perfection your entire life inside and out. That is God's unyielding, eternal standard. And any honest person would say, but Brian, besides Jesus, the God man, nobody can do that. And that's the point of this verse, is it not? All have sinned. All fall short. That's why we all need a Savior. And that's the bad news. That starts in Genesis when our first representative had, he sinned. And we all descend from him. We're all sinners by nature, by choice. But that's why the good news is so good. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That if you will, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. He's Lord. He's God. He's King. You're not. Submit to him. Believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And it's through him and him Along. Jesus said this, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but by me. And I do that right now for two big reasons. Number one, if you're here tonight and Christ is not your Lord, your God, your King, may I implore you, make that decision now, sooner rather than later. Because literally, literally, every breath you are taking is God's mercy on your soul. Giving you one more chance to repent of your sins, turn away from them, and put your faith in Christ alone for salvation. He alone has paid the price you could never pay. He's done it for you. Put your faith in him. And then I did it for a second reason. Dear Christian, please notice what we just did. We went from dinosaurs to the gospel. We gave answers to get to the answer, Jesus Christ. Because again, that's what this is always about. Apologetics in God's word is always about giving answers to get to the good news of Christ. To see the salvation of souls and see God glorified through that process. And again, that's what this is all about. A ton of stuff we covered. If you want more answers on this, to dive deeper on any one of those particular issues. Got tons and tons of articles on our website about dinosaurs. Lots of articles about dinosaurs. Kid-friendly to adult-friendly. Hundreds of videos that are free on the website as well for adults or kids on that issue. So just be sure you bookmark that website. There's so much good stuff there. Uh, be sure you got that bookmarked. 
And if you, if you missed Sunday morning, I'd really encourage you, please get the book, The Lie. Check that out. It's the foundational textbook of our ministry. It's why all this stuff matters so much and why it's so relevant to defending the gospel and proclaiming the gospel effectively in a day and age like ours. So it's a great book. I encourage you to check that out. Why are so many leaving? The book already gone. Fantastic research on that. Gives you a good idea of how to counter that. And then the answers books, again, check those out. Got lots of great chapters on dinosaurs, uh, giving answers about them, uh, talking about did they, did they evolve into birds? Of course, no, but a good chapter on that. Lots of great questions on dinosaurs answered in the answers books. Lots of other great resources as well. Check those out. If you got questions about the books or DVDs, what works best for you, please ask. I've read most of them. I've watched most of the DVDs. I can really point you in the right direction and be glad to help in any way that I can. And, of course, in my book, Quick answers to tough questions. I do cover a lot of the questions about dinosaurs, so those answers are in the book. That's a good quick reference tool on that, so you can check that out. And then this DVD, Quick Answers, I do talk about dinosaurs for a little bit at the end, give you a quick five-minute summary of dinosaurs from a biblical perspective. Other great books and DVDs, we'll have the resources out there in between the sessions. And then after the second session, they'll be there for a bit, but then we've got to pack up and put them in boxes and to get ready to ship them off tomorrow. So if you want to really look at stuff now, it's a great time in between the sessions to check all of that out. And then we've got some great books on dinosaurs for kids and adults. This is a newer one. It's really good for kind of five to eight age group. Really well done. This one's good for kind of the middle schoolers. Goes through the seven Fs. It's a really good book on dinosaurs. And then it goes from dinosaurs and gets to the gospel. So it's a great book for so many reasons. This book's a fun one. It talks about all the dragon legends all around the world that sound like dinosaurs with man because that's what it was. And it's also a pop-up and a pull-out book. Therefore, it's awesome. We put those two things together. So you can check that out. For the younger kids, preschool kids, D is for Dinosaurs, a great book for them. Also, we have corresponding DVDs for D is for Dinosaur, N is for Noah, A is for Adam. And then the Answers for Kids has tons of questions on dinosaurs answered in those books. If you want this talk on DVD... I've got a similar talk recorded from Bodie Hodge, a good friend of mine, also a fellow speaker at the ministry, researcher, does a lot of great work. Same content, different personality, but same information. And so you can check that out for the same information on dinosaurs for DVD. Also for the kids, for my money, this DVD is one of the best ones we have for kids. It's really well done. It's Ken and Buddy Davis. Buddy Davis does a lot of great work with the ministry, does a lot of music. It's got computer, uh, it's got the cartoon stuff added in for the younger ages groups. And uh, it's an old one. You can tell because Ken still has brown hair. But don't tell him I said that, all right. <laughs> My brown hair is going away too. But anyway, the, uh, so, but it's in there. It's really well done. It's really an effective tool for teaching them truth and the gospel. So I encourage you to check that out. Of course, tons of other DVDs. If you haven't been here, we've got a YouTube special going on. Any combination of books or DVDs for those prices. And so be sure to take advantage of that. And then uh, I'll go ahead and make this announcement. Probably shouldn't, but I will, just so you all know. A lot of times you may have bought a few books a while ago, and then you're going to buy some more now. If you did like, you know, three for 35 earlier and you want to do now, you want to buy two more, we'll just kind of combine that. We'll make you pay the difference and not give you a whole new deal. So in other words, if you want to get two more books, it would be just 20 bucks instead of whatever the combination of the cost would be. So it's a great little thing to do if you want to do that. Also, I encourage you to check this out. We had some pocket guides for the kids this morning for a dollar. These are books about yay big on individual topics dinosaurs, eight men or whatever, we've got some left over. So we'll sell them to you for a dollar if you'd like to get those. They're really helpful on so many levels. They're not intimidating, good for a lot of age groups, little pocket guides, really helpful tools, just a dollar a piece. They'll be out there on the tables. You can check that out. And don't forget about the magazine. Does and They do an incredible job with the magazine. It's literally one of the top selling Christian magazines in the world. I really encourage you to subscribe for that. It's really well done. It deals with so many issues and so many of the, not only the origin issues, but also the social moral issues issues from a biblical perspective. It's an effective tool to equip you with current answers to current issues. So I encourage you to look at that. And if you've got questions, please come see me. That's why I'm here. Don't be afraid. Please come talk if I can help. I will be glad to help any way that I can. But if you do think of something later on, you can find me on Facebook or Twitter. Feel free to engage me there and I'll be do my best to respond and help you in any way that I can via those social media platforms. So all that being said, we will take a break. Give your ears a break, all right? And we'll, have, we'll come back at 8 o'clock for the last session. One blood, one race, one savior. It is powerful. I know it's getting late for some, but if you can stick around, this is one of the most powerful talks we do because of this current cultural climate on this issue. So I encourage you to stay if you can. See you guys back at 8 o'clock.